Good morning to you all. I'm Professor Ramesh Chandra Goss, Dean and Head Kalanidhi Division, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, to this uh, international webinar on Anand Kumaraswamy, Reconstructing Post-Independence Indian Art History. You all know uh, Anand Kumaraswamy is one of the greatest art historian, and uh, IGNC is having uh, his personal collections. Keeping that in view, we are holding this international webinar. And we are honored to have uh, none other than Dr. Rosa Lipsey, an eminent art historian, editor, a translator, and a biographer, uh, to grace this occasion as a keynote speaker. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Lipsey, and many thanks for your uh, accepting our invitation uh, to deliver this keynote address in this international webinar. We are honored to have you in this webinar. We are also expecting... Uh, Mr. Peter Kumaraswamy, grandson of Anand Kumaraswamy, to join uh, during this webinar uh, as a special guest. Uh, we look forward to his joining and we thank him for accepting our invitation to join as a spe special guest in the webinar. We have eminent speakers to speak and discuss on this topic. Uh, we have Dr. Anand Bardhan, uh, a senior faculty from Delhi Institute of Heritage Research and Management, uh, from, which is affiliated uh, uh, from IP University. And uh, he is also a uh, secretary of Museum Association of India. Welcome, Dr. Anand Bharadar, and thanks for accepting our invitation to one of the speakers in this webinar. We have with us uh, uh, Dr. Parul Pandyadhar, uh, Associate Professor, Department of History, uh, University of Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Dhar, and thank you for your kind presence, and uh, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank we you have, for inviting me. Welcome. We have uh, uh, Dr. Manjushri Hagade. Uh, she is Assistant Professor in Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peet, uh, Koyambachur. Okay. So thank you, Manjushri, and uh, welcome to this webinar. And yes, we have honor of having my, my uh, former colleague, uh, Professor Dr. Ad 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 A. Uh, she was uh, head of uh, Kalakosh and uh, have, have been uh, worked with publications of IGNC and very extensively contributed in the growth and development of IGNC. So welcome, Dr. Call, and uh, thanks for accepting our invitation to join this webinar as one of the speakers. My colleague, Dr. Sanjay Jha, uh, who was uh, looking after the cultural archives till recently, now he has been appointed as a regional director in Ranchi, IGNC Ranchi Center. He will be moderating the seminar. And I also have uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Gunjan, uh, she will be proposing board of thanks. And, and uh, I have my two very uh, uh, eminent scholars, Dr. Jasveer Singh and Dr. Abhijit. Uh, they will be providing a technical support for this webinar. So with these uh, words of welcome, let me just give you some introduction about uh, uh, various kind of collections uh, we have. Uh, Jasveer, give me rights for presentation. I have two slides here. Uh, we have... Uh, Beautiful collections, uh, personal collection of eminent scholars. So I just want to give you some glimpses of those those collections. Uh, just be busy. Give me the presenter site. Let me just uh, uh, share uh, some of my collections to you because uh, as a speaker and and particularly Dr. Uh, Lipsey uh, will be uh, definitely uh, want to know that how are what are the collections we have in Kalanidhi and how these collections are being looked after and uh, what are the various kind of research programs we have been taking care of. Kalanidhi Division uh, of IGNC is having various units, uh, Kalanidhi Reference Library, Kalanidhi uh, Manuscript Unit, Kalanidhi Cultural Archive, Kalanidhi Visual Archive. We have uh, a large collection of uh, manuscript over uh, uh, 300,000. Uh, we have Visual Archive from over 100,000. We have a print library, which have eminent personal collection of about 24 personal collections. But here we are discussing and talking about our Kalanidhi Cultural Archive, uh, which is uh, having useful research collection of literature, personal histories, recitation, paintings, music, folklore, and tribal art, etc. And we have some of the rare collections, uh, uh, almost 45 personal collections donated or acquired from different families, or by the scholars. And uh, some important in this literature category, we have Dr. R.C. Rangra collection of audio recordings of interview with the writers of Indian languages. We have about 41 audio cassettes, which we are uh, digitizing it. We have uh, Voice of Tagore, audio recordings of Gurudev Rangna Tagore, uh, 
we have akhilesh mittal collection recording of renowned urdu poet firak golopuri in in uh, uh, our sculpture vastu shastra vastu shilp category we have uh, lance din collection which having 9998 uh, art objects uh, then we also have some slides and some uh, other uh, photo prints we have benevolent bahel collection of ajanta caves uh, we have samundat mitra collection of terracotta uh, decorated temples of west bengal uh, in the photography category we call it chaya patra we have eminent uh, the most important and most valuable collection of raza din dayal uh, photographer uh, of 19th century we have a 2500 glass plate then contact prints of 2743 print of paper 638 Studio equipments nineteen, furniture pieces thirty, microfilm studio register five, green days uh, exhibition mount two sixty eight, and documentation material of brochure etc twenty two. Then we also have important collection of Cartier Vesho uh, photographic in, uh, on political leaders and uh, event of the uh, and post in uh, independence India about one hundred and seven. We have DRD Valia collection of photographs of national and international event about eight hundred uh, prints. Uh, we also have david oldrich collection of photographs uh, photography by jyoti bhatt and uh, raghav uh, kanerian we have ashwin mehta's photographic collection uh, we have uh, martha stavon collection of photography uh, we have sunil jana collection and sammu shah collection of photographs of guru ravindranath tagore uh, in music category we have important collection krishna swami collection photographic and audio collection we have s natraj collection of audio recordings on carnatic music we have vak rangra collection of rare recordings of carnatic music uh, we have rangnaik aigri ayengar uh, collection of western classical music we have dr s bankatesh collection on carnatic and indian music we have elizabeth bruner's paintings uh, uh, which was donated by the mother and daughter and they will a uh, part of collection with us uh, other part is with the shanti niketan and the another in hungary uh, in uh, national life uh, museum of hungary then we have cook costumes and jewelry family has donated his personal collection of large amount of so we are developing a special collection uh, with the help of his son uh, mr ashish khokar uh, which is which is going to be uh, announced soon so let's talk about the important thing which we are discussing today anand kantins kumar swami uh, so this personal collection uh, before talking about his personal collection uh, let me just i i know we have uh, very very eminent speakers to talk about talk about him but just a introductory word from me he was a pioneering historian and a philosopher of indian art particularly art history and symbolism and an early interpreter of indian culture up to the best uh, he was one of the great art historian of the 20th century whose uh, multifaceted writings deal primarily with the visual art aesthetics literature and languages folklore mythology or religion and metaphysics his most mature works adaptly expound the perspective of the perennial philosophy by drawing on a detailed knowledge of the arts crafts mythology cultures folklore symbolism and religions of both the east and the west along with this rainy on and sridhi uh, shan anand kumar sivi is considered as leading member of the traditional analyst school of comparative religious thought and uh, his collection uh, we received in two parts initially we got some collection in 95 and uh, later in 2008 from uh, his legal heirs of the uh, anand kumar swami which include uh, uh, paintings and drawings uh, miniature and modern more than 200 in number we have sculpture in stone bronze and wood more than 60 we have correspond correspondences with the important personality like stella karamashish alvin mores alexander kunyangam and william prothenstein uh, more than 700 folders in the collection uh, which covers a broad spectrum of uh, anand kumar swami's work on in the field of his art history philosophy religion and social criticism present in these papers are types with drafts proofs and revised published copies of many of his articles and few of his books We have photographs more than 200 in number. Music records. The collection consists of about 603 78 RPM records of Columbia Ground Fund Company, Orion, and they can record. The recordings are mostly instrumental, and uh, artists from abroad have sung in various languages. We have some books and slides also. So these are some of the glimpses of uh, like these are uh, the paintings uh, 
uh, beauty of those paintings or the sculptures, or the variety of sculpture in this collection. So uh, we had been planning to digitize, uh, 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 make clear, clear a virtual space and also showcasing permanent exhibitions uh, time to time different exhibitions. So, there are a number of tasks we are undertaking. Uh, we look forward to many of the experts in this field uh, who are who are willing to help us in, in doing various kind of research and other activities based on this Ananda Kumaraswamy collection. And that is the main purpose of this webinar to discuss with the eminent scholars in the field and uh, uh, come out with some kind of plan and proposal so uh, we can we can we can uh, do more on this because the basic purpose of the collections housed in Kalanidhi are uh, multi-purpose and uh, uh, these uh, collections uh, by 45 collection what we have acquired in Culture Archive 24 collections in Kalanidhi Reference Library multi-purpose is that to to showcase this to the scholarly community to come out with various kind of publication based on that, hosting seminar, conferences, exhibitions, and also to invite scholars working in those areas to work with us on various research projects. So with this, uh, I welcome you once again. Uh, Dr. Sachidananda Joshi, member secretary of IGNC, is, uh, is, is, is going to chair it. Uh, he has been called for some urgent work by the minister. He might join in the end uh, of the webinar, but uh, uh, he has conveyed his best wishes and thanks to all of you. So with these words and welcome, I now uh, invite uh, my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Jha, to moderate the discussion and invite you uh, in the sequence. Uh, and uh, I will be present uh, till end and, and may, may come back in the end for some any further comments or suggestions. Thank you very much and look forward to hearing all of you. Dr. Lise, I may request to please uh, start your keynote address. It's really delights me to be connecting with you all. I have such strong memories of the IGNCA when, when I last visited. And uh, my goodness, it's a joy to see you all. So I've, I've prepared a talk called AKC Scholar and Poet to see Kumaraswamy as a whole, to accept that whole and make it in some sense one's own remains an enduring challenge. One is free, of course, to favor one part of his intellectual life work or another, the early graceful writings on Sri Lankan and Indian craft in the spirit of William Morris, written in the first decade of the 20th century, the Swadeshi writings of the same period and in the next decade, the groundbreaking collection and publication of Rajput painting, the introductions to Indian art and culture typified by his elegantly written book, The Dance of Shiva. And with this, we have only reached the year 1918, after which the Boston catalogs of the 1920s and the 1927 history of Indian and Indonesian art the fruit of a new intention and intensified scholarship, even including mastery of Sanskrit and Pali. And then the turning point, evident from 1932 <laughs> forward, when his writings are as much concerned with what he called the traditional metaphysics of India and the West as with the history and interpretation of art. In some of the most arresting essays and books, of that period, the two concerns are inextricable. In the years from 1932 to his death in September 1947, he was impelled forward by a scholarly pedagogic mission, and I dare say the biblical Ruach Elohim, the wind of the Lord, which blows where it will and blew strong in him. He was pleased on occasion to convert the complexity of his cultural vision into polemical essays and radio talks, sermons, really, intended to educate forgetful moderns about the deep values he so cared for. It was of those years, the 1930s and 40s, that he wrote, the harvest is ripe and the time is short. He had become an ascetic of knowledge, 
the beautiful, quiet face in photographs from the mid-1930s aged into the face of a unique patriarch, a desert father whose mind sang Rig Veda. Can one choose one or a few parts of this commanding, tireless life performance without regard for the rest? I have never done so. AKC wrote to a friend in 1939 about the continuity between his art historical work and the later writings. And I'm quoting here, you connect my change of interest from art history to metaphysics with age. And no doubt that is in a measure true, though I would perhaps rather say maturity than age. However, I would also like to explain that this was also a natural and necessary development arising from my former work in which the iconographic interest prevails. I was no longer satisfied with the merely descriptive iconography and had to be able to explain the reasons of the forms. And for this, it was necessary to go back to the Vedas and to metaphysics in general, for there lie the seminal reasons of iconographic development. We think of his later writings, at least of well more than a few, as witheringly difficult. He acknowledged unrepentantly that this was so. Writing to a friend in 1942 about a particularly difficult text, he said, I am afraid my booklet is hard reading. And to his wife in 1935, when she was studying in India, the paper is so long and detailed as to be almost unreadable, but you will enjoy it anyway. His method in the most difficult papers was exhaustively comparative and cross-cultural. I am impressed by the concordance he wrote to a friend in 1939, often amounting to verbal identity of Western and Eastern scriptural pronouncements, and therefore enjoy weaving a logical tissue in which each echoes the other in a sort of harmony. All of this is clear. Every persistent reader of Kumaraswamy knows well the challenge of exploring with his guidance the enjoyable, logical weave. But there are qualities in AKC's writings that easily go unrecognized. His fervor, his feeling, his beauty of language and concept, the poetic force that suddenly makes itself known even in difficult writings at moments when he distills a thought into its elemental constituents by means of stunning language. In a late essay, he asks, can we imagine a perfected ardor apart from understanding or a perfected understanding without ardor? In a letter of 1938, he raises this issue in another way. He wrote, the so-called objectivity of science is very often nothing but a kind of aloofness that defeats its own ends. Who can be said to have understood scripture or plain song whose eyes have never been moistened by either? I live in a world, he once affirmed, in which not only words, but all things are felt to be alive with meaning. And to a learned friend, he wrote, philology is not enough. The word must live in you. This too is Kumaraswamy. These are signs, brief but telling, of his heartfelt engagement with the materials of his scholarship. They speak to the theme I wish to contribute to the conference, to come to some perception of Kumaraswamy as a scholar capable of refined poetic expression dry and thoughtful, to be sure, but rhythmic, exquisitely worded, quite perfect. I think it best to start by recognizing a turn in the road he traveled. He insisted on and practiced exact scholarship. That was never in doubt. 
but he also came to view sacred art and scripture as a source of or invitation to deep change in the Indian context to initiation, in the Christian context to metanoia. To give life to this view of sacred art and text, to reflect the life it had in him, he would on occasion adopt evocative language, literally language that calls. To exemplify this sound in his writings and its array of meanings, I have pointed more than once to the opening paragraph of his long essay of 1938, The Nature of Buddhist Art, which I ask you to hear again. He wrote there, in order to understand the nature of the Buddha image, and the meaning for a Buddhist, we must, to begin with, reconstruct its environment, trace its ancestry, and remodel our own personality. We must forget that we are looking at art in a museum and see the image in its place in a Buddhist sanctuary or as part of a sculptured rock wall. And having seen it, receive it as an image of what we are ourselves potentially. Remember that we are pilgrims come from some great distance to see God, that what we see will depend upon ourselves. We are to see not the likeness made by hands, but its transcendental archetype. We are to take part in a communion. The image is of one awakened and for our awakening who are still asleep. The objective methods of science will not suffice. There can be no understanding without assimilation. To understand is to have been born again. There isn't time now to explore step-by-step step this movement of thought and feeling from the initial disconcerting shock. We must remodel our personality to the concluding affirmations. In one of his most memorable essays, Some Vega Aesthetic Shock, dating to 1943, he evoked the internal aspect of truly great art. I experienced something of that kind when I encountered the words we have just heard. In the deepest experience, he wrote, that can be induced by a work of art or other reminder, our very being is shaken to its roots. I have myself been completely dissolved and broken up by Gregorian chant and had the same experience when reading aloud Plato's Phaedo. That cannot have been an aesthetic emotion such as could have been felt in the presence of some insignificant work of art, but represents the shock of conviction that only an intellectual art can deliver the body blow that is delivered by any perfect and therefore convincing statement of truth, the body blow. We're speaking now of a connoisseurship vulnerable to the works it explores. For students and scholars of art history, works of art can be moving, of course, but there is no expectation that they be life-changing. For the seeker or wayfarer, as Kumaraswamy put it, the issue is rather different. Works of art are means on the way toward initiation, toward profound metanoia. Here is how he expressed the issue in a letter of uncertain date. All religions are agreed that the goal lies beyond logical thought, beyond good and evil, beyond consciousness, and all pairs of contraries. The way is another matter. On the way, one must use means, notably means of thought and discrimination, valuation, and so on. In other words, use the ordinary instruments of thought, symbols, verbal or visual. Such are our images. By their means, one advances on the way. Kumar Swami was both scholar and wayfarer or seeker. From this dual identity, 
and the creative tension between them emerged the beauty of concept and language to which I'm pointing. He could see with a scholar's eyes and mind, but seeing led to felt insights, which he was willing from time to time to put into words. In a letter of 1945 to a trusted younger friend, he addressed this dual identity and its fruits. When I go to India, he wrote, I shall hope to find a guru myself. At present, all I have done is what is called intellectual preparation. However, that is déjà quelque chose, already something, and brings about a good deal of liberation. What liberation I have thus attained, and however little it is, is still eminently worthwhile has come about mainly through constant reading of all the traditional literature and learning to think in those terms. It means, of course, a metanoia, a thorough change of mind. To undergo this transformation demands a simultaneous crede ut intelligas and intellige ut credas, believe so that you may understand understand so that you may believe, quoting St. Augustine. It must be time now to hear from Kumaraswamy's writings more of the striking passages where he writes as a scholar and poet, a poet not only of words, but of concepts that fit together, obey a kind of scansion of ideas and brighten one's mind. I'm thinking, for example, of a passage in his learned study of the symbolism of the dome, a passage in which he sets out sedately enough to recall certain Aristotelian and related medieval Christian ideas and unexpectedly characterizes beauty in works of art or craft as if that beauty faces us and speaks the essential word of presence and readiness, the words of Moses and Isaiah, here am I. And now I'll quote that passage. It can be said of all humane artistic operation that its ends have always been at the same time physical and spiritual good. This is merely to restate the Aristotelian and scholastic doctrine that the general end of art is the good of man, that the good is that for which a need is felt and to which we are attracted by its beauty, by which we recognize it as though it said, here am I. And the whole or holy man has always been conscious at the same time of physical and spiritual needs and therefore not in any capacity merely a doer or merely contemplative, but a doer by contemplation and a contemplative in act. The last words are incantatory. They evoke a condition of consciousness and wholeness that has nothing to do with interpretive historiography, everything to do with the human condition and its possibilities. The symbolism of the dome is ascensional. It is the way up. The affirmation, here am I, finally belongs more to us than to the work of art. We come alive in front of great art and know that we are there. Kumaraswamy's attitudes toward the art of his own time ranged from uneasy to condemnatory. There were early exceptions. He had been friendly with the Tagore Circle and members of the Bengal School and included a generous selection of their work as illustrations in his 1913 Myths of the Hindus and Buddhists. In the 1920s, he had befriended in the United States the truly great photographer and gallerist Alfred Stieglitz and himself practiced photography. But those relations were well past at the time, 1937, he published one of his most compelling essays, The Part of Art in Indian Life. 
I suppose he could have chosen to write nothing about contemporary Indian art, however he conceived it, but he did not evade the issue. The result was pages as beautiful as any he would write. He acknowledged that the traditions of Indian art and craft he valued had largely fallen away. He spoke of arts that are not arts, which overcrowd our palaces and drawing rooms. He offered praise to those few Indian artists and craft persons whose use and understanding of art are innate and untaught. According to our understanding, he reflected, the only service that can be rendered to the innocent is one of protection. All direction has been lost, he continued, and there is revealed the dark disorder of our life. Can we refer to any sign of life or evidence of a reintegration to any art bespeaking the entire man? His response to this melancholy question is utterly surprising. Yes, he answered. The weaving of homespun cloth, kavir, an art in itself of immemorial antiquity is effectively a new thing in our experience. This is an art that answers to human values as we understand them in light of our present environment. For the present, he continued, we have neither ends to be served nor meanings to express for which another and more intricate art would be appropriate. The time might come for that, he continued, but for the moment it wasn't possible or necessary. And at that point, something breaks open in his thought. The essay's concluding words place Kagar in a vast context. In a vast context. Naturalize it into a cycle of making. The essay's concluding words place Kader in a vast context, naturalize it into a cycle of making and quiescence that no one but Kumaraswamy could have evoked. I quote, art, whether human or angelic, begins in a potentiality of all unuttered things, proceeds to expression, and ends in an understanding of the absolute simplicity or sameness of all things. Time will not permit me to exemplify many other passages where this beautiful break in thought occurs, where something more enters Kumaraswamy's exacting discourse. I do wish nonetheless to put before you two further passages. Returning to his magisterial essay, The Nature of Buddhist Art, there is a place where he speaks of the portability of sculpted and painted images which models in his careful imagination the relation between a material symbol and its spiritual referent. He wrote as follows, an image or other symbol can be carried about from place to place, not that the spirit is therefore in one place more than another or can be carried about, but that we and our supports of contemplation are necessarily in some one place or another. If the use of the symbol is to function mediately as a bridge between the world of local position and a world that cannot be traversed or described in terms of size, it is sufficiently evident that the hither end of such a bridge must be somewhere. And in fact, wherever our edification begins, procedure is from the known to the unknown. It is the other end of the bridge that has no position. The passage is dizzying. The movement of felt thought from level to level is rapid, surprising, beneficial. This too is Kumaraswamy. One further passage in the part of art in Indian life where our author speaks of angels, prophets, patriarchs, and builds the traditional understanding of what moves such high beings as they address the human community. The texts cited by Kumaraswamy are Rig Veda and Chandogya Upanishad. He has nothing to say but what they say, 
And yet somehow one hears him. Somehow he is speaking to himself and to us about the source of beneficent knowledge and action. What was best and flawless in them, he writes, already quoting scripture, implanted in the innermost, that by their love was shown forth. And at this point, he interprets in his own voice, in the innermost, literally hidden, that is, imminent in the hollow of the lotus of the heart, where only are to be realized all the possibilities of our being, both what is ours now and what is not yet ours. It is in the heart that the swift instigations of the intellect are fashioned or thought is formulated as a carpenter hews wood. In another essay, Kumaraswamy wrote, speech comes to rest in silence when all has been said that can be said. That is not my situation. There is so much more I would wish to put before you concerning the poetic force of the scholar. But I will close with all my thanks for Dr. Sanjay Cha's invitation to participate in this conference and for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rujal Limsi. Thank you very much. I have troubled you a lot. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, I'm read some, uh, some biodata on uh, Rujal Limsi cell. It has not been done due to some technical issues. So, uh, Dr. Rujal Limsi, a renowned biographer, art historian, editor, and translator, and for me, he is a scholar friend of IGNCA and ardent admirer of Honorable Dr. Kapila Vasanji. He attended Yale College and the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, earning his doctorate at the latter institution, where his dissertation was focused on Kumar Swami's life and writing under the direction of Stella Kramis and Robert Goldwater. Roger's first major publication was the Kumar Swami trilogy in the Bollingen series, Princeton University Press, 1977. Two volumes of uh, AKC papers followed by a biography of the master. In 1988, Roger published an art of our, uh, our own, the spiritual, in, the spiritual in 20th Century Act, a work conceived in the spirit of AKC about artist and movement of a scant interest to him. Roger's later writing, later writing include Angelic Mistakes, The Art of Thomas Merton, 2006, the first, uh, the first study of the renowned monk and author's visual art practices in the 1960s. Following Kumar Swami's example, he has also published on politics and society, notably, notably Hammer's Code, Alive, 2030, the first full biography in 40 years of the remarkable second UN Secretary General. Roger's most recent books are God uh, reconsidered the life and the teaching, the legacy, 2019. Politics and conscious Dag Hammer Colt on the art of ethical literacy, 2020. He lives in the lower Hudson Valley, New York, New York State. He is the keynote. I mean, so he already elaborated his uh, talk on the poetic and scholarly life of Kumar Swami. I also welcome Dr. Adhivet Vadni Kaur, Dr. Parul Pandeharji, Dr. Anand Bardhan, and last but not the least, Dr. Manjushri Hegde. And uh, I need to tell about something about the Kumar Singh, whatever didn't I know. Just to begin with that, I also welcome scholars, students, and participants who have enthusiastically registered their names for the webinar. Just to begin with, I would like to say a few things about the legendary art student Kumar Swami who was a rare intellectual of modern Asia, who was a philosopher of art and advocate of ancient glory of India, starting his career as a director in immunological survey of Ceylon. He entered into the domain of art history and architecture. After the termination of the tenure in immunological survey of Ceylon in 1996, he crossed over to India for the first time, and his first all being at a sprawling Joransko house of Gurudev, at a time when the anti-partisan, the boycott, and so this movement were into being, he 
huge observer patriotic and culture nationalistic emotions the most prolific service to india was the revival of philosophical interpretation of indian art and scientific criticism of the western art his interpretation of buddha image yakshas and more importantly his writing on early architecture of india was a philosophic philosophic explanation of uh, the religious art he was the first scholar who brought to the fore the religio cultural value of artifact he focused on symbolism of art object being a scientist he not merely interpreted art as a culture product rather as an object that revealed the scientific knowledge of sthapatis and shilpakar it is he studied a great number of classical indian texts for presenting a comprehensive picture of art art and its ideological backdrop his pioneering research included the dances of shiva that made him the best known interpreter of asiatic approach to art it is in his writing of shiva that the best of the his scientific analysis of symbolism in art is expressed his essay indian idols with many arms tears apart western art critic contempt for indian sculpture rooted in the indolence of indian tradition he set the tone for examining west western scholarship on indic tradition almost a century earlier he pioneered the current scholarly effort in this area challenging eurocentrism in indology indology and the rest his history of indian indonesian art was to become magnum opus and a significant landmark in indian art history in this he comprehensively described the development of indian painting sculpture and architecture as we know in his letter as we know in his letter phrase he focused on comparative philosophy religion culture music his introduction to indian art is itself a masterpiece mandatory reading for anybody interested in the subject he was one of the first to recognize and condemn the far reaching disastrous consequences of the megalite education system in education in india he writes i cannot think the european teachers and educationist quite to realize how far english education as it is given in the east is crossing all originality and the unfort- uh, unfortunate individuals who pass through the mill yet the babu and the fail ba upon whom the englishman looks down so contemptuously are the fruit of his own handiwork the inevitable result of the method of education which he himself had introduced broadly speaking you take a people and educate its children in foreign subject and do in a foreign language ignoring their own culture and their surprise at their stupidity suppose that england was governed by china man and premium set on chinese culture english children taught chinese subject in the chinese language and left to pick up the english language and tradition any anyhow at home could there not be some failed mandarins apart from sculpture of india he collected indian miniatures and tried to establish that this form of art itself has a typical indic characteristic his total published work runs to more than 200 uh, titles of course these are not facile essay but the result of intensive and painstaking research involving sources drawn from more than half a dozen languages sanskrit pali prakrit greek latin german french english and material from literature archaeology science and technology ethnology history religion ethics and metaphysics for him the greatest goal of his life was to find out indigenous root of art in india it was of course a nationalist thought that played an important role in his long journey as an art historian he actively participated in several meetings organized by indian nationalist leaders fighting against the british imperial powers and the british uh, were closely watching the association of the freedom fighters the circumstances compelled him not to settle in britain and that was the biggest loss to british academia his love and passion for deep rooted indian ethos could be felt in the following quoted by himself my own father for example was cremated to ceylon another member grandmother of the family had to convey the ashes to ganga and perform the ceremonies there thus every indian is bound by religious ties to the holy soil of india the holy land of india is not far off palestine but the indian land itself kumar swami He intended to retire from his position as a curator of Boston Museum of Fine Arts, America, in order to return to India, where he planned to complete a new translation of the Upanishad and to take sannyas. 
These plans, however, remain unimplemented due to his sudden and untimely death on September 9, 1947, almost 73 years back. However, the essence of uh, Anand Kumar Swami were emerged in the Ganga by his wife, Dona Kumar Swami, to commemorate century celebration on Kumar Swami in 1977, a film biography of Kumar Swami for United States Information Service was directed by Chidanand Das and B.D. Garga, and the script was written by Jagmohan, the former Minister of Government of India. For this webinar, six scholars with planning work in this respective field have been invited. And uh, I welcome all uh, welcome scholars, students, and participants who have enthusiastically registered their name for the webinar. Our second um, uh, speaker is Dr. Adet Vadni Kolji. Uh, Dr. Kol Adet Vadni Kolji is our former chief editor and associate professor at course IGNCA. Dr. Kaul had her initial education in Srinagar, Kashmir, where she was born. For her master's in Sanskrit, she proceeded to Punjab University, Chandigarh. Thereafter, he opened her MPhil uh, and PhD degree from the Center of Central Asian Studies, uh, University of Kashmir. After completing her PhD, she had joined the faculty of Center for Central Asian Studies in the University of Kashmir. But the exodus happened soon. She joined IGNCA in 1991 and she was mainly responsible for preparation of the two fundamental series of publications, Kalatatukos, a lexicon of a lexicon of Indian art concept, and the Kalamul Sastra, fundamental test on Indian art. Her first publication was Buddhist Savant of Kashmir, their contribution abroad. She has also attempted the Hindi version translation of Lalbak, uh, the uh, renowned Kashmiri series Unijam and 14th century. Organizing four conferences in two, uh, 2016 and 17 on Acharya Abhinav Gupta during the millennium year celebration of this genius from Kashmir who gave direction to the understanding of Indian art and culture was a great achievement. Agency has brought a large number of teleprints and the revised edit editions of Anand Kumar Swami's writing on varied subjects under one of its fundamental publication series, Kalas Kalasamalochanas, series concentrating on the anatomical interpretative studies and art. Her presentation will mainly focus on his writing brought out by the IGNC and Kumar Swami. May I request Dr. Uh, Dr. Call to start? Please, ma'am. The respected chair of the webinar and member secretary IGNC, Dr. Sachidanan Kyoshiji, who I hope will be joining soon. My former colleague, Professor Ramesh Chandragod, expert scholar on Anand Kumar Swami, whom we heard just now. Dr. Roger Lipsy, Dr. Anand Kumara Swami's grandson, whom we are expecting to join, Mr. Francis Nicholas uh, Kumara Swami, my co panelists, and all online members joining us in this webinar on Anand Kumara Swami. I thank IGNCA and its authorities for inviting me to this webinar on a personality. That is very dear to me, and I have got benefited by his writings to understand the intricacies of my own tradition and art with its strong spiritual background and which has been an ever-evolving process since thousands of years. I thank Sanjay Jha for contacting me on behalf of IGNC. I want to share that the name of this genius called Ananda Kumar Swami got registered in my mind when I was just start, when I had just started collecting material for my PhD. It was in the serene atmosphere of the main library of Punjab University at Chandigarh that I laid my hands on the works of Ananda Kumar Swami for the first time, and I was highly impressed by his ideas. Later, when I joined IGNC in 1991, I was thrilled to find his works forming a part of IGNC's publication program. Soon after, in 1992, I got an opportunity to assist Professor Premlata Sharma, who was an eminent musicologist and a fine Sanskritist. She had been assigned a project by IGNCA on preparing the revised edition of the 
30 songs of Kashmir and Punjab, compiled and edited jointly by Ratan Devi and Anand K. Kumar Swami. Ratan Devi was the adopted name of Ellis, Kumar Swami's wife. Since Professor Sharma did not know Kashmiri language, she sought my assistance in editing the Kashmiri songs according to correct pronunciation for preparing the notations. Then it was finally in the year 2003 that I got the charge of handling the complete series known as Kala Samalochana series and the works of Anand Kumar Swami formed the most important part of this series. As many scholars present here know, it well that through his prolific writings, Anand Kumar Swami, Kumar Swami reveals himself as a great art critic, philosopher, and a historian of our time. Anand Kumar Swami collection occupies, as we have been told by Professor uh, Ramesh Gaur, that it occupies a very significant place in the cultural archives of IGNC. This collection was acquired by IGNCA two times. First part was acquired in 1994 through the efforts of Dr. Kapila Vatsa, then member secretary and founder member of the IGNC Trust. She personally met Dr. Rama P. Kumar Swami in the US and he very generously donated a part of his father's collection. This collection includes books, photographs, gramophone records, some unpublished papers and slides. The second part was acquired by IGNCA in 2008 from Francis Nicholas Kumaraswamy, grandson of Anand Kumaraswamy. IGNCA has brought out around 20 publications of Anand Kumaraswamy's works. These include the reprints of the revised editions of his works and the volumes of his collected papers on specific subjects. One of the most important aspects of these revised editions is that IGNCA by getting hold of the personal copies of the author who used to keep on adding marginal notes on his personal copies. In the revised editions brought out by IGNCA, such notes have been incorporated. A volume of the selected letters of Anand Kumar Swami was published for the first time by IGNCA in 1988. These letters reveal the being of this uncompromising man who believed in no theories of ideologies, political or philosophic isms. Combining scientific precision acquired through his training as a geologist with his own sensitive, sensitivity, 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 Kumar Swami addresses himself in these letters to the disciplines of history, philosophy, religion, arts, and crafts. These letters show incredible range of his mind, which cuts across civilizations, cultures, languages, arts, and crafts, encompassing the whole. His book, What is Civilization, was published by IGNCA in 1989. The 20 essays constituting this volume raise fundamental questions. In one unbroken sweep, a, a vast spectrum of Western and Eastern civilization is covered. The four essays in this volume, namely Mind and Myth, Symbols, symbols Interpretation of Symbols, and Symbolism of Archery, reflect the rightness of Kumar Swami's mind journey as an art historian. Man's awareness of time has been art articulated in ancient and modern civilizations through cosmologies, metaphysics, philosophy, religion, theology, and arts. In his book titled Time and Eternity, Kumar Swami propounds that though we live in time, our deliverance lies in eternity. He provides detailed accounts of the teachings of each of the main world religions. In his transformation of nature and art, Kumar Swami attempts to explain the theory behind medieval Europe and Asian art, 
European and Asian art, especially art of India. The first principle of his theories is that art does not exist for its own sake. It exists as a means to some religious conditions and experience. He supplements the Indian theory with that of the Chinese. Compassion with the comparison with medieval uh, European art is also extremely illuminating. He shows that both differ radically from post Renaissance European art. While discussing the theory of art in Asia, Kumar Swami contends that the Indian artist did not seek an illusion of nature. Rather, he tried to create a truthful suggestion uh, of the character of the subject. He investigates through Indian texts the psychology, the Indian uh, psychology of the Indian view of art and discusses the origin and use of images in India. In 1933, Kumar Swami published a new approach to the Vedas. And thereafter, he regularly brought out larger and shorter studies of the Vedas and Upanishads till the year 1947, when he passed away. These studies, published in a variety of American, European, and Indian journals, were arranged and published in a volume titled Perception of the Vedas and published by IGNC in 2010. This volume opens up a new vista of interpreting the Vedic lore to integrate our own fuller being with the fuller manifestation of the cosmic order in which resides the eternal truth. The Indian theory of government is expounded on the basis of the textual sources in his work on spiritual authority and temporal power in the Indian theory of government. The mantra by which the priest addresses the king, spells out the relation between the spiritual and the temporal power. This mantra was it, uh, has its analogous application in the cosmic, political, family, and individual spheres of operation in each by the conjunction of complementary agencies. The welfare of the community in each case depends upon the succession of obediences and loyalties, that of the subjects to the dual control of king and priest, that of the king to the priest, and that of all to the principle of the eternal law, that is dharma. Kumar Swami's elements of Buddhist iconography deals with the basic symbols of Buddhist art, namely tree of life, the earth lotus, the word be and uh, the fiery pillar. It shows that these symbols can be traced back beyond their first representation in Buddhist iconography through the aniconic period of the Vedas and that they represent a universal Indian symbolism or set of theological concepts. Kumar Swami's contribution to the study of Jaina art is compiled in the volume uh, essays on Jaina art. He was the first to recognize its chronological place in the succession of style. The Jaina paintings are the greater interest, uh, are of greater interest as they are the oldest Indian paintings on paper, representing an almost unknown school of Indian art. In order to make the paintings fully comprehensible, a short account of Jainism and the legions of Mahavira and Kalakacharya, which are the main subjects of the paintings are given. It also deals with the explanation of various terms, Jaina cosmology, aesthetics, and the relationships of Jaina paintings, the illustrated Jaina manuscripts, and descriptions of the figures. Kumar Swami's essays on music were earlier published in a few books and journals, etc., these were brought together and published by IGNCA in 2010. Kumar Swami held that music in countless ways had been bound up with the Indian national culture, for it was the most universal expression 
of emotion. Music belongs to every part of life. The flute of Krishna, the veena of Saraswati, the dance of Shiva, the Gayatri mantra as cosmic chant or music of the spheres. The, the hymn of passionate adoration of the Southern Shaivite, all these belong to the association of music and religion. In addition to the art of music, Kumaraswami lays great emphasis on the folk songs of art, uh, agriculture and crafts. This music is serving the uh, this music is serving to lightening heavy labor, such as the songs of uh, husbandmen, craft carters, and boatmen. Music remains too intimately associated with the religion, with drama, and with life, whether courtly or popular, and was faithfully guarded by tradition. Kumar Swami was much against the harmonium and gramophone when compared to stringed instruments. Even the piano he held was an inferior instrument. Every time these mechanical instruments were used in place of man, the Indian music musician was degraded. His living was taken from him and the, ground, and the group sound of Indian life injured, he says. Among musical instruments, he gave pride of place to the veena. He firmly believed that the importance of music in education can hardly be overestimated. He bemoaned that foreign education had paralyzed the living impulses of Indians and driven India to a state of social disintegration. How important this, I, this he's saying way back in, let's say, 1940s or before that. He advocated that the restoration of Indian folk and art music to its proper place in Indian education would result in the understanding of the self-expression of India in her music. Such enlightening ideas enumerated from a few publications brought out by IGNCA uh, uh, from the writings of, the, of Anand Kumar Swami are indeed instrumental in awakening our uh, uh, awakening us to the beauty of our own tradition so i have not covered all the publications but the main which has which have uh, uh, touched my mind so i wanted to share these few points with you thank you very much thank you dr call it's a very in a very short notice you have come to uh, attend the webinar and you had to sit some other places so thank you uh, very much once again. Uh, now the next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Parul Pandya Dhar. Uh, Dr. Dhar teaches South and Southeast Asia art, Asian art uh, at the Department of History, University of Delhi. Her research writing focus on ancient and early medieval Indian art, art historiography and connected histories of Asian art. She authored the Toranas in Indian and uh, Southeast Asian Architecture, 2010, edited Indian Art History Changing Perspective, 2011, and co-edited Temple Architecture and Image of South India and Southeast Asia, 2016. Asian Encounter Exploring Connected uh, Histories, 2014, and Cultural Interface of India with Asia, Religion, Art, and Architecture, 2004, besides contributing several research papers, she has served as a jury member, peer reviewer, editorial board member for several international conferences and journals, and has been awarded prestigious fellowship and grants located in Europe and the USA. May I request uh, Dr. Paul Pandre to please begin with the talk, please. I have just thanked uh, Dr. Sachidanan Joshi, Dr. Ramesh Gaur, uh, uh, Dr. Jha and Dr. Rachel Pandya for this kind invitation. And I'm delighted to be sharing space with Dr. Roger Lipse today, uh, who's uh, continued and consistent and enlightening works on Ananda Kumaraswamy have uh, brought his contributions to us 
in uh, such a refined manner. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Lipse, for uh, you know for joining and for staying on to listen to all of us as well. Uh, well, uh, what I have chosen to speak about today is essentially uh, the contribution by Ananda Kumaraswamy uh, that spans a period from uh, the 19, uh, from about 1927 onwards to 1947, a period of about 20 years, the time when he wrote most of his uh, influential writings on early Indian architecture. And uh, from, the from the mid 1930s, the shift in direction in the ways that in which he approached uh, the study of early Indian architecture. Now, uh, Kumaraswamy uh, approached the study of traditional Indian architecture from a historical, technical, as well as from a metaphysical and theoretical perspective. In his own words, the origin of a structure can be considered both from an archaeological and technical or from a logical and aesthetic or rather cognitive point of view. Or in other words, either as fulfilling a function or as expressing a meaning. And then he hastens to add that these distinctions between the archaeological and technical and the logical and aesthetic are really not real distinctions, but uh, you know, conceptual distinctions. Uh, so what I'm concerning myself with begins in 1928, and I think after Dr. Lipse and Dr. Advait Vadini calls discussions of his earlier works, uh, this automatically contextualizes, and I don't have to repeat the kind of work that had come in before 1928. Now the immediate uh, impulse, I think, in 1928 for Kumaraswamy to have written uh, his very, very uh, detailed essay on Indian architectural terms in the Journal of the American Oriental Society, and also a critique of P.K. Acharya's architecture according to the Manasara and his Dictionary of Architecture, which in his uh, in his inimitable style, he appreciated much, but the review is really uh, a very incisive dissection of uh, the way in which P.K. Acharya analyzed the uh, terminology pertaining to Indian architecture. And uh, Kumaraswamy flagged two important points there. One about how it is important to actually relate to the empirical evidence of early Indian architecture, be it in sculptural reliefs, be it in be it on coins, be it in texts. Uh, you know, to relate the texts to the available evidence, which uh, apparently P. K. Acharya uh, was not very comfortable with, and secondly a direct association with the tradition of building as it survived. So the stapatis and the shilpis. And uh, it is there that he uh, very uh, incisively points out uh, that a study of the use of the words which later appear as established technical terms in the Shilpa Shastras is of great value for the study of architectural history. And that early use of the words, you know, the semantic concerns of how terms like the Chandrashala or the Torana or the Vatayana uh, and so many others that he lists in that, uh, you know, exemplary uh, yet somewhat incisive review of uh, P.K. Acharya's work. I just take a very small example of the Chandrashala which is very well known to most students of Indian art history. And he goes about to explicate that the Chaitya window is unsatisfactory as an explanation for the Chandrashala, as the form is by no means peculiar to, nor can it have been originally devised expressly for Chaitya halls, 
Now, interestingly, since we are also trying to talk about post-independence uh, writings and art history and Kumaraswamy's legacy, uh, despite this very early clarity on, on this, uh, you know, in, in textbooks on art history, you continue to read Chaitya Gavaksha as the explanation for the Chandrashala. Uh, he goes into the uh, functional and the, uh, you know, the manner of making of uh, early architectural forms in this period of his writing. And he talks about the gable form as having been derived from that of an ordinary barrel vaulted house end. And then he says, okay, Chaitya window doesn't work too well, but Toran is perhaps correct in so far as the Gavaksha or the Chandrashala is actually an aperture, a window. And to that extent can be adorned by a Torana arch within. Vatayan or the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know the, the function of ventilation, which he talks about, in, in so far as it is a window is all right, but neither is sufficiently specific. So what is he doing here? I mean, there are reams and reams of this kind of uh, writing in, in uh, Indian architectural terms. But what he is really trying to do is to uh, nuance these terms on the one hand, and on the other hand, also to show how over time the meanings may have changed in relation to actual evidence of architecture from various sources. Uh, so here is you know, how he relates the Chandrashala to many other uh, uh, you know, uh, types of forms, including those that are actually apertures and those that then become later patterns as uh, exemplified in the two, the two cases exemplified one in the fifth century Chandrashala, which is now located in the government museum Mathura, and this beautiful limestone relief from Ghantashala in the Andhra region, second century AD, which is today in the Musee Gime in uh, Paris. Now he goes on to again explicate on the Chandrashala, and he talks about how the problem is a little complicated by the fact that we have to do both with arched windows that actually act as entries or vatayans, admitting air to upper chambers, dormers, or attics with real internal space, and also with similar forms used decoratively and placed in series on cornices, as for example, we saw in the case of Ghantashala. Now, what he says is that this then leads to the, you know, the actual function of the Gavaksha as an open dormer aperture then leads to motifs of this kind and patternings of this kind that you see. So already at this early stage, you know, the, the those who critique his understanding of the empirical and the actual uh, would uh, find this fascinating that it was not a lack of understanding of the functional and the uh, you know material aspects of architecture that he moved more and more in the later years towards the uh, metaphysical. While he was doing those uh, writings on Indian architectural terms and going through the nuances of the semantic and empirical concerns of architectural elements. And when he wrote that critique on P.K. Acharya's dictionary and uh, his interpretation of architectural terms in the Manasara, he himself was very preoccupied uh, in the same years with writings on different aspects of early Indian architectural types. And these came out in four volumes, the last one posthumously much later with the help of Michael Meister in 1988. But the first three on cities and city gates, on Bodhi Gharas and palaces came out in uh, different issues of Eastern art. 
and there he moved uh, through a range of texts. The other thing about uh, you know his uh, uh, you know intense uh, spiritual metaphysical leanings uh, of him really feeling more like a hermit of the arts. He that that major phase is uh, preceded by this intense association with forms and not only forms as in an aesthetic appreciation of the forms but also in the dynamics of their making the you know how wood architecture or timber related to later stone architecture or how the mud and what wattle uh, huts had a role in the shaping of the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain sacred architectural uh, types, and uh, the other, the other in very uh, early contribution of Kumaraswamy is the range of texts that he consulted. So he was; it was not as though his focus was only on the Vedic and the Upanishadic literature, but he was just as deeply engaged with the, um, you know, with, uh, as uh, you know, Dr. Lipsey showed with Christian uh, literature uh, and in India or, uh, you know, in India and Sri Lanka and associated South Asian regions with the Jataka literature, with uh, Jain uh, texts such as the Aupapatika Sutra and the Raya Pasenia Sutra, he dug out literally uh, what I like to call as a textual turn in art historical studies if you place him within the post orientalist discourse in Indian art historiography. One finds that he was literally excavating a range of cultural texts and relating these in a, you know, to the manifestations, removing earlier standards, uh, Western standards of uh, interpreting Indian art. So it is, you know, 1930s is that period in Indian art history when he brings such a lot of force and energy into a more culturally contextualized interpretation. In this case, uh, and for my paper, uh, on early Indian architectural uh, manifestations, their, their relationships to other forms and so on. Now, he also goes through the <clears throat> Kautilya's Arthashastra and works out how, the, you know, in his article on cities and city gates, he works out how the city gate is explained in the chapter of the Durga Vidhan in Kautilya's Arthashastra and the, compares these with city gates shown in the sculptural reliefs at Barhut and Sanchi. I should correct myself, not just Barhut and Sanchi, also Amaravati and other places as the range of drawings will illustrate. Now, just, you know, first the textual normative of the city gate in Kautilya's Shastra. And he goes about quoting in, in, a, in a frenzy. He had just far too much to give, far too much to write, uh, uh, frenetic mental emotional involvement with the plethora of art and literature of India, uh, an absolute passionate involvement with, uh, uh, with this, otherwise this uh, amount, this, this corpus, and variety of his writings would have been impossible uh, uh, to have come about. Now he talks about the city gate in the Durga Vidhan of Arthashastra saying, Dvayor attalakayor madhye saharmya dvitala madhyar dhayamam pratolim karayet. And how between two gate towers, a two and a half story structure called the pratoli needs to be created. And then the subtle distinctions and the nuances between the Pratoli 
and the Torana and the Gopura, semantic concerns that I have the good fortune to address in my uh, thesis on the Torana in Indian architecture, where all of us, uh, whether of the generation prior to me, uh, you know, uh, Kapilaji or uh, uh, M.A. Dhaki or uh, S. Setter, R. N. Mishra, and several others, or any of us or our students, we need to really sit back and think why we always go back, we, even if to disagree, even if to critique, or to draw from and move ahead, is, uh, you know, often a lot of his writings become the starting point, be it about the Indian craftsman, be it about Indian and Indonesian art, cross-cultural aspects of art, be it about Indian architecture, iconography, sculpture, it always is something that one has to draw from, one needs to draw from because he has already excavated so much. Now here we have the cities, city gates from Sachi and he compares the textual and the available to uh, available visual to cre recreate forms of architecture that were not any more available in Situ. But I must uh, move on to other aspects of his work, the Bodhi Gharas. Uh, again, here he is simultaneously dealing with the Chandrashala, with actual apertures versus the uh, patterned uh, you know, dormers, and the relationship of the Torana and the Chandrashala and the uh, uh, Vatayana uh, or the uh, relationship between the Torana and the Gopura and the Pratoli. So these, these are not uh, just exercises of the intellect. Uh, these are equally exercises uh, of the uh, empirical and the uh, material that he merges so imperceptibly with the metaphysical in this stage of his writing. Here are the creations of the various types of bodhigaras from the sculptural reliefs and from textual uh, readings. In a very fascinating article on the Pali Kannika, he speaks of the circular roof plate and uh, goes through again a range of texts particularly Pali literature of, of Buddhist affiliation, to arrive at the meaning of Kannika at the time of the making of these, uh, these kind of structures. And he talks about the Paduma Karnika, the lotus pericar. And uh, after cross-examining, as was his uh, method, uh, cross-examining the textual, the visual, and the archaeological, he arrives at this, that it will now be obvious that the kannika is made of wood, is connected with rafters. These are the rafters inside the bhaja cave. It is to be seen from within the house by looking up. Now he's slowly coming to the aperture. Yeah? And it is the most honorable part of the house. And then he says, actual representations of the interiors of secular buildings are, of course, very rare or unknown in early reliefs. But it is well known that in early rock-cut Jaitya halls, he had been able to find two or three such examples of the Kanika. And here, I, what I have placed are the Gopanasis or the rafters, which are then related to the roof plate or the Kannika. And now we are coming to his slow transition in the 1930s to, this is 1938, symbolism of the tomb, where he once again recalls that article on the Pali Kannika and says that it can hardly be doubted that the Kannika or the roof plate of a dome structure the meeting place of its converging rafters, as we see here, had most certainly, as the term Kannika, Paduma Kannika suggests, 
it was the form of a lotus and now in 1938 this is not part of that article this is part of the symbolism of the dome that it, that lotus was in effect the sun the lotus of the i'm sorry there is a um, cut in my in a laptop screen but he connects the lotus with the sun and now you see the change that Dr. Lipsey so nicely had explained in his keynote address, that it is certainly not by purely practical considerations that one can explain the position of the Harnika or little dwelling immediately above and outside the apex of the stupa, whereas the raison d'etre of this emplacement becomes immediately evident if we understand that all that is mortal is contained within and all that is immortal exceeds the structure. Now, this relationship between the, uh, the Gopanasi rafters, the Pali Kanika, the lotus aperture, the sun and his writings on Swayam Matrinna uh, and the, you know, uh, all of this ties up and you find traces of the way that he th thought about early Indian architecture in uh, how he is now, you know, in the, in the polar balance of the physical and the metaphysical veering more and more towards the metaphysical. And he says the modern, he was by this time also sharply aware of uh, the kind of criticism that, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of cynicism that may be generated by an overly metaphysical reading of something that is a tangible art form. And he says, he distinguishes between the modern viewing of an ancient uh, architectural expression from its, uh, you know, uh, what it may have meant at the time of its making. And he says that the modern critique is apt to maintain that symbolic meanings are read into the facts, which must originally have no meaning. The emphasis is Kumaraswamy's but only a physical efficiency. Far from sentimental fancies, a correct symbolic exegesis must be founded on a real knowledge of the principles involved and supported by cited texts, which are just as much facts as the monuments themselves. Now, he finds fault with this too, so that in the contemporary critique of Kumaraswamy, it is important to go back to his own explanation of, his, of an anticipated critique of his approach. And he says that the modern critique is apt, of, however, to argue that even the oldest citable texts are already meanings read into still older forms, which perhaps had no intellectual significance, whatever, but only a physical function. But he says that precisely this point of view is a revelation of our own mentality, our division of artifacts. And this uh, statement in the symbolism of the dome, I find, presages his writings on ornament or alankar. And he says that this is our division of artifacts into industrial and decorative, applied and fine art, and this would have been unintelligible to the primitive, I don't know why he says primitive, and normal man who could no more have separated use from meaning than meaning from use. Which brings me to some of his final writings. Uh, in 1939, an exceptionally uh, perceptive uh, piece on ornament where he talks about ornament as 
sufficient or adequate symbolism and not a trinket. So he just distinguishes between a, uh, a frivolous trinket uh, as ornament, a rather abharana or alankara as a complete uh, sort of essentiality uh, that the form itself is ornament. The ornament as essential form is an essay that uh, Michael Meister has uh, also written. Uh, the Indian temple can hardly be conceived without its alankara devatas. The cosmos itself is made effective by the sacred buildings that embody it. So he accords a certain agency to Alankara, uh, not as a peripheral, but as an integral aspect of Indian architecture. Which brings me to the year of Kumaraswamy's passing away, 1947, uh, by which time, uh, you know, he, he still had so much to, uh, to write and so much to, to offer, but he was by this time far more towards the impulses that were un that undergrid and pervaded the forms rather than, you know, not the what and how, but the why of Indian architecture as he himself so nicely sur surmises in the symbolism of the dome. Uh, for uh, this night, this was in 1946 that Stella Cranbridge's the Hindu temple, her magnum opus came out, and he, he mentions her and her work in uh, this uh, small piece, an Indian temple, the Kandariya Mahadev, and uh, says that we are thus brought back again to the concept of the three analogues: bodily, architectural, and cosmic houses that the spirit of life inhabits and fills. And we recognize at the same time that the values of the oldest architectural symbolism are preserved in the latest buildings. From the mid 1930s, though Kumaraswamy's method did take account of the visual empirical alongside the textual, his interest in the visual did not exceed to an analysis of the form or style of Indian art per se in his later writings. To him, the formal or representational in art was of interest in so far as it signified an inner meaning that almost always reverberated with spiritual quality. Indian art history was a lot to Ananda Kumaraswamy, and uh, I do not, uh, as as, a, as an art historian writing in today's uh, day, uh, expect or imagine that a, a person of the intellect and perception of Ananda Kumaraswamy would not have wanted to be critiqued. But the fact remains that he has left such a huge corpus of work behind him that no serious work on these aspects, and there are they are they're numerous, uh, can proceed without first going back to his arguments, getting inspired, learning from them, sometimes to admire, appreciate, at other times to take forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paru Pandeaji. And thank you, thank you once thank again you for, for, uh, for elaborating all the, all the things very beautifully. And due to this seminar, you have extended your program. That was uh, on the same day, but you have extended it for some yeah, reason. Yeah, no, thank no, you no, once no, again. My, my thank privilege you. to do so. Thank you. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Manjusri Hegde? Dr. Manjusri Hegde. Yes, Dr. Hegre. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Manjusri Hegre currently serves as assistant professor in Amrita Darsnam International Center for Special Studies in Komodur campus. She was a research fellow at in Infinity Foundation India. She obtained MA in Sanskrit in 2006. She is qualified in national eligibility test at University Grant Commission. 
she has extensively studied Advaita Vedanta, Bhagavad Pada, Samakara, uh, Sureshwara, and their Sri Asutha Asutha Narayana Avdhani in Mathur, Karnataka, Vyakarana under Dr. Puspes Dikshit in Bilaspur, Chhattisgarh. She has also studied Nabhinaya, Puro Mimansa, and uh, Sankhya under uh, Kanta Palli and Professor Vienja. She obtained BE in Mechanical Engineer from PhD Bangalore. And uh, she is a uh, blogger also. And uh, may I uh, request uh, Dr. Hedge to please begin the uh, lecture, please. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank IGNCA and Dr. Sanjay Jha in particular for inviting me to be a part of this very important webinar. Uh, I must also add the disclaimer that I am no scholar. In fact, I'm uh, surprised at my audacity to be here to pretend to understand Kumar Swami, the metaphysician extraordinaire. For me, this is simply an opportunity for Swabodha Parishudhyartham. So, uh, I just want to put that as a disclaimer. That said, uh, today I want to discuss uh, Kumaraswamy's ideas, the broad metaphysical ideas on art, beauty, and beatitude, which stand diametrically opposite to the modern conception of art, beauty, and beatitude. Uh, so let me begin with his um, approach to art. What is art? Uh, for Kumaraswamy, the definition is very simple. Art is the embodiment in material of a preconceived form. The embodiment in material of a preconceived form. This definition very clearly involves two components. A, the preconception of a form, which means visualization of the object to be depicted, and B, the embodiment of this preconceived form onto a tangible material, which means what has been visualized, whatever has been seen through the mind's eye, this mental image is imitated in the available material, stone, canvas, clay, etc. So, for example, a painting is not art. A sculpture is not art. These are artifacts, things made by art, but not art itself. For Kumaraswami, art is an ability, the capacity which allows the artist to first see in his mind, in his Antar Sudhayakasha, the true underlying form of the object, and later embody this visualized form onto a tangible material. So there are two aspects to it. The first aspect, the visualization of the object, that is the preconception of the form, Kumaraswami said, is yoga. And the second is technical. It's a matter of skill. I'll dwell on this just a little bit. In the first operation, in the visualization of the object, the artist goes within, concentrates intensely on the object that he wishes to make so intensely that the separation between him, the subject, and the object of contemplation is completely removed. So he achieves a unity of consciousness, samadhi, if you will. This unity of consciousness, Kumaraswami calls as yoga. He says that it is in yoga that the artist sees the image of what he wishes to make. See, this, is, this directly reflects on Kumaraswamy's central doctrine that true art does not imitate nature as it is. It imitates nature in her manner of operation. This is originally a Latin phrase attributed to Aristotle. It is a reference to Plato's mimetic theory of aesthetics. Uh, I want to dwell on this very briefly. Please bear with me. See, according to Plato, the sensual world is a world of shadows. Like the prisoners of Plato's allegorical cave, who can see not the true forms of the things paraded before them, but see only their shadows cast by the fire. We do not see the truth of the phenomenal world that lies before us. According to Plato, a true artist must ignore the shadow figures. He must see beyond the external appearances, see the true underlying forms of objects, and depict this in his material. Kumaraswamy's ideas are very similar. 
to copy exactly the external form of everyday objects like a vase of flowers or a horse or a living person is not the aim of a true artist see if there is an individual horse in front of me this individual horse kumar swami said is the direct manifestation of the platonic idea of horse what makes a horse to be a horse or a tree to be a tree or a man to be a man or a cow to be a cow in sanskrit we will call it gotva that which makes the cow a cow which, which differentiates it from a horse this is the underlying un intangible idea or form that is synonymous with soul so when an artist draws an individual horse that is in front of him he is copying only the manifestation the appearance not the truth of the horse not that which makes the horse a horse so kumar swami said that a true artist must not imitate this or that horse he must try to depict the underlying form of the horse if he captures this if he captures this that his depiction is as much a direct manifestation of the original idea of the horse as the individual horse in front of him so the artist would have imitated the operation of nature not nature itself he would have partaken in the same process as god and for the same ends as kumar swami says because at the end all appearances proceed from the interior outwards from an uncreated and principal interior to the manifested or created order indeed from god to the world the manner of this divine operation is what the artist must imitate and for this he must first see the underlying form through yoga and then transform this onto a tangible material so before he begins his work then the artist must clear the mirror of his intellect and gather his scattered powers of concentration for the act of this creation so he has to practice such disciplines as fasting prayer and meditation see folk kumar is kumar swami shows that this definition of art is not specifically indian in nature he quotes from indian tradition definitely shukraniti sara abhilashitarth chintamani different shilpa shastras but he also quotes from plato from plotinus from dante eckhart blake rumi the chinese tradition i have just taken one example from the chinese tradition where he says and the prince of lu asked him a carpenter what mystery is there in your art no mystery your highness replied he and yet there is something when i am about to make such a stand i guard against any diminution of my real vital power i first reduce my mind to absolute quiescence three days in this condition and i become oblivious of any reward to be gained five days and i become oblivious of any fame to be acquired seven days and i become unconscious of my four limbs and my physical frame then with no thought of the court present to my mind my skill becomes concentrated and all disturbing elements from without are gone i enter some mountain forest i search for a suitable tree it contains the form required which is afterwards elaborated i see the stand in my mind's eye and then set to work otherwise there is nothing i bring my own natural capacity into relation with that of the wood this is one example that he quotes and this is um uh, exactly in sync with say what someshwara will say chintayet pramanam tad dhyatam bhitta niveshaye and this is what kumar swami shows that traditional societies who founded on the same metaphysical principles that are applicable universally timelessly in his words the formal element in art represents a purely mental activity chitta sanya from this point of view it will appear natural enough that india should have developed a highly specialized technique of vision the maker of an icon having by various means proper to the practice of yoga eliminated the distracting influences of fugitive emotions proceeds to visualize the form of the devata the mind produces or draws akarshati this form to itself as though from a great distance 
the imager must realize a complete self-identification with it. The form thus known in an act of non-differentiation is the model from which he proceeds to execution in stone, pigment, or other material. Now, this execution in stone, pigment, or other material is the second aspect of art creation. The visualized form is transformed onto the tangible material, and similitude is with respect to this form. See, similitude can be of three types. Absolute sameness, identity. Second, imitative or analogical likeness. And third, expressive likeness. That is, the imitation is neither identical with nor comparable to the original, but it is an adequate symbol and reminder of that which it represents. This is what Kumaraswamy meant by imitation, not absolute sameness, not analogical likeness, but expressive likeness. An example is that of a lotus. In traditional iconography, when you see a lotus depicted in a sculpture or painting, you are not being shown the flower that you will otherwise see in a lake. Why should you be shown this flower in a painting if you can see the real one for itself? No, the lotus, the flower or the leaf arising from or resting on the waters represents the ground or substance of existence both that whereon and that wherein existence is established firmly amidst the sea of possibility. This is the signification. See, for Kumaraswamy, there is a definite, precise, unchanging and eternal relationship between the object and its symbol, between the signifier and the signified. A mathematical relationship exists between the earthly objects and those above. In macrocosm and microcosm, everything is tied together through proportion, representation, and signification. This brings us to Kumaraswamy's idea of beauty. Everything is beautiful to the extent that it adequately replicates the form of the idea conceived in the mind. Beauty, therefore, is integrity or perfection proportion or harmony and clarity or illumination. The more perfectly a thing participates in the principles of beauty, the more it is mimetic of the forms conceived in the divine mind, the more beautiful it is. So beauty is order, symmetry, proportion, harmony, clarity, reason, dignity, virtue, suitability for purpose and illumination. A work of art is beautiful only in terms of perfection, or truth to the preconceived form. It is beautiful to the extent it is what it purports to be. When a thing is well and truly made, he said, that is when it is made by art, it is beautiful. It is beautiful because it is perfectly made. And because there are no degrees of perfection, he showed that there is no degrees of beauty. A thing is either beautiful absolutely or it is not. This brings us to another important doctrine of Kumaraswamy, that there is no distinction between a fine artifact and a utilitarian object. A well-made table is not less beautiful than a well-executed raga. He writes, there is no distinction in principle of orator from carpenter, but only a distinction of things well and truly made from things not so made and of what is beautiful from what is ugly in terms of formality and informality. But you may object, do not some things serve the uses of the spirit or intellect and others those of the body? Is not a symphony nobler than a bomb, an icon than a fireplace? Let us first of all beware of confusing art with ethics. Noble is an ethical value and pertains to the a priori censorship of what ought or ought not to be made at all. The judgment of works of art from this point of view is not merely legitimate, but essential to a good life and the welfare of humanity. But it is not a judgment of the work of art as such. The bomb, for example, is only bad as a work of art if it fails to destroy and kill to the required extent. So, he, so it is that he says, <clears throat> For Kumaraswamy, every product of art is at once beautiful and useful. He completely rejected the idea of art for art's sake. An artifact is beautiful if and only if it answers two questions. First, is it true? Second, what good use does it serve? So for him, 
The function of an artifact is threefold. First and foremost, it must always and only supply a real or imagined need or deficiency on the part of the human patron for whom the collective consumer, the artist, works. Second, vyutpatti, didactic education, which is the unconscious phala, fruit of a true work of art. And third, in the process, a true work of art fulfills another need as a support of contemplation. He writes, for the last end of work of art is the same as its beginning, the experience of rasa. Yoga, from a connoisseur's point of view, is rasa. This is the last point that I want to address. Attitude. What is yoga for the artist is rasa for the connoisseur. The experience of rasa is triggered by the beauty of an artifact. It is characterized by a state of lysis, vishranti, an immersion in the aesthetic object to the exclusion of every other thing. The unity of consciousness without any mental movement. Just as the original intuition arose from a self-identification of the artist with the object he wished to make, so the aesthetic experience of rasa arises from a self-identification of a spectator with the presented object. Rasa Svadhana is yoga, also called Nivritti, Laya, Samapti, Samadhi. And what triggers this experience? The beauty of the work of art. It serves as the stimulus to the release of the spirit from all inhibitions of vision. Kumaraswamy writes, the conception of the work of art as determined outwardly to use and inwardly to a delight of the reason, the view of its operation by a way of destruction of the mental and affective barriers behind which the natural manifestation of the spirit is conceived. The necessity that the soul should be already prepared for this emancipation by an inborn or acquired sensibility, the requirement of self-identification with the ultimate theme on the part of both artist and spectator as prerequisite to visualization in the first instance and reproduction in the second. And finally, the conception of ideal beauty as unconditioned by natural affectations, indivisible, supersensual, and indistinguishable from the gnosis of God. All these characteristics of the theory demonstrate its logical connection with the predominant trends of Indian thought and its natural place in the whole body of Indian philosophy. This aesthetic experience, he says, is inscrutable, uncaused. It is virtually ever present and potentially realizable, but not possible to be realized unless and until all the effective and mental barriers have been resolved, all the knots of the heart undone. And this occurs through the cognition of beauty, which is nothing but the attractive power of perfection. So what emerges from all of this is that traditional art, according to Kumaraswamy, is religious in nature, in its creation, in its existence, and in its purpose. So the artisan tries to see the material world around him as a manifestation of that universal spirit, tries to capture the intrinsic unity and harmony of the whole of creation, and tries to bring all of that into his work of art. This stands in stark contrast with modern aesthetics, which regards art as simply an expression of the artist's personality. Beauty here is literally skin deep. This Kumar Swami criticizes as a product of perverted individualism, Renaissance conceit, and 19th century humanism. For Kumar Swami, modern art, founded on earthly news, is mundane in its origin. True or traditional art, on the other hand, is of a divine origin. It is linked to a metaphysical order and therefore religious in character. I'd like to conclude by saying that I think it is supremely important for us to study very seriously the writings of Kumaraswamy in order to understand our own traditions, to understand aspects of our own culture. Because without Kumaraswamy's bhashya on our tra tradition, this commentary, most of it will remain grotesque and unintelligible for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, extend my gratitude to IGNC again and to Professor Sanjay Jha for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manjushri Hegreji. We have beautifully narrated all the research theory to us. And now I invite uh, Dr. Anand Burdhan, 
I uh, may I just uh, talk few lines about the um, uh, Anand Bardhanji. Uh, Dr. Anand Bardhanji, senior faculty at Delhi Institute of Heritage Research and Management. He has extensively written on the Indian art, heritage, and museum. Dr. Bardhan has specialized in socio-economic and cultural function of sacred complex of India. His doctoral thesis on sacred complex of Tanjapur, with a special reference to Bhredasa Temple, is a scientific study of refractory rituals that play by vital role in conservation of science and sacred objects. His works include a study on sacred rituals, conservation like Kumbhavi Sekam, uh, Turumanjanam, that has opened new research for heritological research in India. He has authored six books. Most important among them is Colonial Museums and Inner History. He has presented a critical review on the writings of Kumar Swami and his contribution to museums. Dr. Anand Bhadan, please. Vani Hiran Nagarabha Bhyam Namaha. I am really thankful, rather grateful to Dr. Ramesh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Jha, Dr. Achal Pandya, and the family of Indra Gandhi Center for Art for giving this uh, opportunity to uh, speak on Kumar Swami, who was fathomable ocean of knowledge. Interestingly, all the celebrated scholars who have delivered lectures today, that has been an enlightening experience for me. I am also, my paper is in fact related to one particular article of Dr. Kushwami that actually changed the entire course of our historical debate in India and also the debate about Indian art in for interpreting Indian art and very especially see that I have to talk the scripture on Savism about that I have talked. It is interesting that the dance of Shiva, this very begins with this trota ten from Tiruvakam, which is a Tamil text. And this Tiru is an anthology of Shiva, which in fact describes the and his very, very divine aura that attracts the devotees. And in this respect, Kumar Swami has quoted particular hymn, or you can say the poem, To Dui Shaviyan Vidhi Pura Tu Vena Madhi Shudi. Several very interesting words I would like to quote. What attract is the what attracts is Karana, the ear, the Jagat Dhar, Yora, who upholds the world, and what makes him so divine, so luminous, is the Dhata, or purity, and is Vena, Shiva, as a luminous star, who, who has actually created this great cause. And then the Jamukut, the crown of that the crescent is there, the Chand, and it makes him so bhayamana, so bhita. So the Tam poets were actually charmed by, by the very persona, the divine persona of Shiva seen by the Tamil Trasta. Actually, Kumar Swami has focused on that issue. I am supposed to quote four of the great Nainar Tiru Nyan Samar, Sundara, Kavashagar, and Upper Swami, who were and devotees and who revolutionized the world of treasure, the Tamil world, your own time, how they look on Lord Shiva. Very interesting and important. Tiru Nyana, he looked at Shiva like an innocent. 
his perception is that of an innocent child that he was an adolescent a kishora mani looked at him actually as a house grihastha and parashwami composed song on sea as one who is an old person experienced person experienced person so these are actually collected collected in te aram srota or de which are dedicated to lord shiva kur swami had then shifted sanskrit in particular strota kush strotam karash shaiv bhuvane nivashya kanachit ratna pith vidhatum abhivanchi shula panau de pradosh samay nu bhanjanti sar one who is perform dance समय प्रदोष संधि काल एंड ही रिजाइड इन हिज मेटेनियस अबोर्ड एंड हिज डांस इज डेडिकेटेड टू थ्री जन द मदर गॉडेस हु हैज क्रिएटेड वर्ल्ड सो दो वर्ल्ड हैव बीन क्रिएटेड बाय द रथ जननी रूपा सरस्वती एंड दिस डांस इज डेडिकेटेड टू उमा what is important that he is dancing on a on a platform that is ratpitham made of some deep precious stone so it is adorned by the kak if you'll go to we have there ye mandapa and chit mandapa she was dancing on the sphere of consciousness and this shula pani sula pa it performer of dance raja has been in entire corpus of literature very mystic in a mystic in a very abstruse at the same time in a very simple way and all the gods and goddesses from three lokas they have appreciate shiva to participate in this divine the shiva pradosh rotam explains it like he ghrutavallaki is playing on veena and shatkhamo the lord indra is on venu rama bhagavati eya prayoganvita and lord lakshmi actually sing the song and shru is also present there and he is playing vishnu shandrangavadan lord vishnu pradangan and this cosmic voice and nice emerge actually kumar swami believed thought in in respect indian philosophy very veda idam na datam jagat it is the nad the most significant aspect of indian philosophy from where brahma emerged and the whole has came into into and in he can quote very very interesting shloka vyaksharam param binda tasyo paristam sa shabde ch akshare chhine shabdam paramam padam me actually has tried to discover in scientific way that from where the spanda has originated spanda is the variation the primal source vibrated and finally energy was transformed into the five elements subliminal element of the world and for kumar swami took course to the kashmiri school of philosophy and he his ideas are actually inspired by the philosophy of vasu gupta in kashmiri shaivas kashmiri shaiva sutra bhut sandha bhut pr- विश्व संघटा दूता मींस ई जल वायु पृथ्वी एंड आकाश फर्स्टली आकाश इमर वी नो इट दैट देयर वाज नथिंग बट दैट आकाश हैड इमर्ज एंड इन कुमार एक्टिंग ऑन शिवा द परसेप्शन ऑफ भूत आकाश एंड आकाश इज इज प्रेजेंट इज वेल प्रेजेंटेड एंड दिस शोज दैट ही to discover the inner merits of indian philosophy 
roots of indian philosophy he was saying philosophically into to the substratum of the highly hierarchical cosmogonical view and he was linking it his expression and this is the reason that again we that in explanation in relation to nataraja the he has moved towards ancient literature saying shak chandhane vishva sangha there is a wonderful figure around it representing the shak and shiva is one who is done within that the chakra and how the dance had begun we understand it that there is a sandana there is ghata there is emergence of nada and it is penned in shastra and also by the philosophy called by vasu and kallata udyamo bhairavah bhairavah bhagwan who is a bhaswar and this is a raman actually there are different dhvani in indian literature and shiva dhvani all and then that is why he is called mahanada the mahanada who controls the universe is mahana narrates the universe and in this creation it's very substantial is the existence of different elements of the world and for this he had tried to take recourse basically to the ancient one of the most ancient literary work of india described as triya prakaran and the very idea of distancial appositorium that if there is there is sanghar there is roop there is aroop is kriti there is vikriti if there is srishti there is a state of thingless and shiva all this vipare is the basic characteristic of all persona of lord shiva depends and so defining shiva his his luminous literature profound literature of country is somehow reflected in the word even though he has not quote any of the shlokas but reflected and we can go through the we swarupebhyo namo namo mahadbhaya punamaha namaha hebhyo rakebhyo one who is viru who is formed ami has described it who is formed he is also one who is verse and who is the cosmic from the most beautiful most glorious form he is over and he is adhaya he is bearing the whole universe he is the bindu roopa the little chul ke he is the chariot and he is also the charioteer who drives the world and he himself the world understand how this cosmological point was encapsulated into a wonderful on the kumara swami and now i explain that how the five elements that he was always very concerned put up on scientific line in his treasure i understanding it is shiva who had everything sarvalok sarvalok aik rakshita sarvalok aik ramata sai panch brahma makam jagat it is from linga puran very very text that shiva has created sarvalok arta destroyer of all the lokas all the world all the world sarvalok aik rakshita he is protector entire universe sarvokaik nirmata is creator of the inner universe inch brahmatmaka shiva he depends all five saying saddo jatah vam devah aghoh abhujah tat tat rusham gim ishanam panchamam shiva is in five interesting and they represent a different element saddu atah mahi pokta vam devam ta jalam ghoram vikhyatam vastat purusham tam isha kaash murdhastha panmam mukham vibhagena 
ami shambho vadana manchakam shiva five form sajat is mahi prithvi vamadeva is jat and ghore is tej fire vayu is purush and ishan is akash so the body is the five elements and how they have originated find it he explained it jagat is just sarvasya janya parmanava the movement of wise at perennial movement of the atom and in explaining he is again taking uh, uh, taken recourse to literature defining i don't have time actually to explain but however one form of shiva of or of aghora in as prajit prichar nambar dharam devam rajyo pavitin rakto shanisham tanetram raktam lyanulepanam the whole form is and he is he is one who is desire one who is self luminous so we can say that shiva stretcher actually well interpreted him one thing very interesting that he has mentioned unnamai very important explaining the form of raja that what are the different lakshana of shiva who is lakshitayan he lakshana basically various lakshana and shiva who is performing dance all these lakshana in this respect in this respect it is very important to note he is quoting a text where Logical meaning of the all the aspects of are well depicted. Like why is he being the drama? Why is the drama? It is the na, is agni, and why is of nature the panch mahabhuta? And in this respect, he has actually uh, described about all the prolific literature which had been available, and. one text is unamai vidagama that is a very important text because here you find that the dance of shiva as tandav in tamil text has been very beautifully described and especially he related the pancha abhikriya with the dance of shiva on the basis of the very text that is unamai vidagam and this pancha abhikriya is a srishti स्थिति संहार तिरोभाव एंड अनुग्रह फाइनली सॉल्वेशन सो शिवा इज वन हु क्रिएट्स द वर्ल्ड शिवा इज वन हु सस्टेन्स द वर्ल्ड शिवा इज वन हु इज डिस्ट्रॉयर ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्स एंड देन तिरोभाव मीन्स हाउ इट मर्जेज इन टू द पंच तत्व एंड फाइनली हाउ इट गेट्स सॉल्वेशन सो कुमार स्वामी वॉज द फर्स्ट स्कॉलर who had not only we can say discovered all the important aspects of dance of shiva and very interestingly the very idea of creation sustenance and destruction dissolution rather we can say that it is the body of shiva from whole world actually has taken the sanghatya means it has got the different forms and the shiva in that respect is the mahat bindu from that mahat bindu itself the universe has come up and this universe will also dissolve in the same mahat bindu so the whole theory of indian cosmology that kumar swami interpreted whether it is veda from which depicts that rudra vai agni shiva dance within the realm of agni itself you can see the figure of nataraja where the flames of fires are all around and he is dancing on apashmara which represents agyana basically all entire gamut of indian symbolism is present is nataraja and it was viewed by kumar swami as a drashta he is trampling agyana because shiva himself is gyana swarup he is pratyaksh gyana in aparoksha anubhuti as shankaracharj has called about nirguno nishkriyo ananta so shiv is nirguna nishkriye and ananta and gyana swarupa and he is 
trampling the worldly ignorance but again on a pundarika peetha kamal peetha this is again related to creation so we can find in his form there is crescent of chandrama representing shoma there is hair lock that actually indicates or denotes or it symbolizes to the complexity of tapasya the tapa dharma and most importantly what is there is the skull means death and life they are part of the very game of the universe and shiva represents these two binary forces together so in brief i can say that the presentation on the the image of shiva as adbalan basically in tamil there is a term adbalan means the great dancer kumar swami has used the term nataraja from sanskrit literature for making the words sarva manya more convincing and he has categorized it shiva who is simply dancing performing the dance it is one form of shiva that is not nataraja shiva who is trampling up a smara is form of nataraja and shiva performing nadant dance creating that cosmic vibration which creates the universe it is another form of dance so through these dance forms and a sound study of the tamil literature very interestingly whether it is tiruvaskam or devaram or the poems of sundarar or appar swami he has tried to come bring to the fore the very essence of indian literature establishing the philosophy of shiva the profoundest one and the most scientific one with these all words i conclude my lecture and again my extend my heartiest thanks to all the scholars and participants thank you very much for inviting me sir thank you very much uh, now may may i request dr uh, dr bor to just start the things i mean concluding us will have to yes, please dr bor thank you sanjay uh thank you all for your wonderful uh, lectures uh, on today uh, memorial day of uh, dr ak kumar swami uh, you all know that he left us on 9th september so i just you try to pay homage to this uh, great art historian by organizing this uh, webinar so uh, we have uh, recorded the webinar and uh, with all your permission the webinar will also be uh, uploaded on our ignc youtube channel uh, your all points have been noted and i'm sure uh, uh, we will be in touch with you and uh, as i mentioned in my uh, welcome remarks that uh, our purpose is to uh, initiate various programs on uh, uh, ek kumar swami uh, like uh, we have a uh, number of uh, action programs uh, beside digitizing or making a catalog available with all these wonderful uh, materials we also want to publish uh, his unpublished papers uh, we also need to uh, curate various exhibitions we want to create a permanent exhibition we also need to uh, take up various kind of uh, other research and publication project and uh, Uh, last my uh, two years uh, uh, after coming back from JNU uh, is that uh, we have been trying to locate good scholars in that area, but uh, still uh, there are certain uh, issues and uh, problem in getting right scholar. Those who are good, they don't have time, or some people are having uh, different locations. So we are very keen to. get your support in identification of young scholars who can work on these collections collections what we have in ak kumar swami the personal collections so this webinar is a kind of to develop connect with all of you it is a beginning uh, in direction of doing more work on on kumar swami so we look forward to be in regular interaction with all of you uh, i'm sure uh, with your expertise and uh, with your ex uh, knowledge of the subject uh, we will able to develop some good good programs uh, based on this collection so that's our one important thing which i, I would like to share with you second uh, uh, important uh, issue which i i feel that uh, we are in the i think it is 100 years of uh, publishing of dance of shiva 
so uh, if we can uh, you can suggest uh, some more programs i have given you some glimpses of the collections available with us so if you can give us uh, some uh, some ideas about what kind of programs uh, next next one year we should organize plan uh, based on this collection uh, we will be happy to receive your uh, suggestions particularly uh, i'll be communicating my email id and all details to all of you so i'll be very happy to uh, have your suggestions feedback in what because we we have plan to have series of programs uh, on ek kumara swami so what what else we can do and how you can help us in and also if you can send us the names of the scholars we have few but we would like to develop a uh, kind of uh, database of scholars on this this subject so we can have uh, different uh, lecture series we can have uh, different webinars by particularly choosing a theme this was uh, something which we have a broader theme but we can think of having a uh, theme specifically uh, and we would like to have scholars from all over the world uh, this pandemic has given an opportunity in form of this using these technologies were there earlier also but we were not Uh, thinking of more utilizing in form of webinars and online lectures so i think we have an opportunity to uh, have um, more such online events in the futures so uh, uh, these these are the two things uh, 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 in in my closing remarks uh, but uh, uh, at the same time uh, i would also like to uh, uh, express my sincere thanks particularly sanjay did a very good work in bringing you all together uh, in a very short time uh, and then and, and i i also thank you because uh, some dates were changed and you were very 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 uh, uh, nice to us in in agreeing to one day change because we want to do either on his birthday or on his memorial day so that's the reason we we shifted birthday we have some other programs we have to shift to memorial day so uh with these words i know uh, you have contributed significantly and uh, dr uh, rosa lexi if you have any last comment to make or any other speaker has to make it to say something in the last comments uh, after that we will we will close the webinar so any any anything which you feel uh, you want to comment uh, or you want to say please uh, you are you are welcome we have few questions also uh i will i will see that uh, if we can take up some questions but before that i would like to uh, have all of you to make a last comment on this one and dr lipsha please it's been um really a joy and deeply interesting to me to hear younger scholars working through this material the intellectual operation in indian art so well so well explored with a sense for its significance um you know we live in a in a time of of uh, all sorts of passions and superficialities and immense difficulty both in india and in america and virtually everywhere and to give our attention to these um to kumar swami's um deep and permanent perceptions of of uh terribly important structures art mind heart is um really very gratifying to me so i'm i'm so grateful that i was able to to be here and i'll just point out to you all that this is the middle of the night for me it's now 4:15 in the morning and i'll soon take my leave Thank you. Thank you very much. We are so grateful to you. Any any other speaker would like to make any any suggestion or last comment? Or shall we uh, close it? Because now I realize that how late we are for Dr. Roser, and I don't want to keep uh, him more. So I now I think. Uh, okay. I think. May uh, I request uh, Bunjan Joshi to uh, just give the vote of thanks. and gunjan joshi is a uh, our project associate and he is she is trained archaeologist and she is working in agencies since more than 5 years so please gunjan joshi 
Thank you, sir. I am delighted to have been given the pleasant duty of delivering the vote of thanks this afternoon. A special mention to our respected uh, member secretary, Dr. Sachidan and Joshi, IGNCA, though unable to make it to this webinar, for being the catalyst that stimulated us to do our best and for his support and encouragement in such kind of academic endeavors. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Ramesh C. Gaur, Dean and Hetalanidhi Division, for introducing and genial welcome of the speakers and for his concluding remarks. The slides the sir had shown gave us a glimpse of the Kumar Swami collection in the cultural archive, which is like really helpful if scholars come forward and do research on that. Apart from that, thank you, sir, for imparting information on other significant collections in cultural archive, like that of Raja Green Deal, Landstein. On behalf of IGNCA, I owe a special vote of thanks to Dr. Roger Lixie for being here because I happen to find out that you have to compromise on your sleep so that you could make it to this webinar. Thank you for your stimulating speech and reading excerpts, otherwise, unfathomable for students like us. We are fortunate to have a wide range of speakers from all arenas for this webinar. Mm -hmm. And on behalf of IGNCA, my gratitude to all the speakers, Dr. Advet Vadim Kolmam, Dr. Parul Bandya Dharmam, Dr. Manjushri Hegre, and Dr. Anand Burdhan, sir, for gracing the occasion and sharing their opinions. Your thoughts have enlightened our minds. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Kumar Sanjaja, who is the moderator of this webinar, for his co uh, enormous cooperation in organization of this webinar. Thank you, sir, for presenting a succinct summary of Kumar Swami and his works. I'm thankful to the motivated and dedicated colleague at uh, Cultural Archive, especially Dr. Shilpi Roy, who is a research officer, and Ms. Manjeet Kumari, who is assistant archivist, for their support and help. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record uh, my husband, Dr. Abhijit Dixit, and Dr. Achal Pandya for the perfect technical support. Finally, I would like to thank our participants for their interest and unwavering attention. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Hope to meet you all again on the same platform or in person. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Vinjan. Thank you all.